buddy? Christian fighter pilot. Is that a mythical creature? Or is that an oxymoron? Who knows? Um, I think I know through my career of three, maybe four of us, Christian fighter pilots, but we don't, we don't associate the two. Typically, if you're a, a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. And if you're a fighter pilot, that just happens to be what you do. So what they are isn't really a fighter pilot. They're a follower of Christ. Um, funny story about Pastor Sean is, yes, two years ago we did meet a, at a men's breakfast um, at a Methodist church, actually. And there were people from, they invited the whole area, so there were probably uh, people from 16 different churches. And there, was a, there was a lot of men. It was a men's breakfast. But there was one woman who was Pastor Sean's wife. Uh, inter- interesting. Interesting. How many hunters out there? No hunters. Oh, my goodness. Anybody? Oh, Any? Vacation hunter? Any military background people? Okay. Married to a military? Father military? Wow, okay, okay. Um, well, for those that are not hunters, um, in my little bag here, um, I have this, this trinket. It's, uh, it's a bullet, about that big. Yes? No, it's a lot bigger than that. It's actually a, a 30 out 6. 5.56 five, is a good guess, though. Very sharp. No. Oh, anyway. So um, that's really, really not a bullet from my perspective. Um, I like to go with something a little bigger. Um, that is a bullet. <laughs> no, that is not a mini rocket. That is actually a bullet. Um, and the gun that shoots it, it's a Gatling gun, and it shoots it at 100 per second. Um, a combat load in the F-16, which means it's full to the gills, and that's as much as it can carry, versus a training load, which is a lot less, because they don't let you go out with that many. But, it's, but a whole combat load of those bullets is only five seconds. Because, I mean, think of 500 of those things. That's just a lot, of, a lot of bulk, a lot of weight. So trivia for the day. Um, I used to fly uh, F-4s. And when I flew F-4s, I flew in Germany. And uh, after a couple of years, we, we, we were in Germany for three years and loved Germany. It was a great place back in the late 80s when the Cold War was still going on. And after a couple of years of progressing through all the upgrades and trying to get qualified to do everything at, all at once, I was finally qualified to fly broken jets on purpose. Yeah, well, I think about it. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a challenge. But I finally was able to fly broken jets on purpose. So we were, uh, we were tasked to fly this one airplane who, that was either really broke or couldn't figure it out. And they wanted us to just go fly it and uh, see if they accidentally fixed it or if it was still broken. So <clears throat> about midway through the flight um, and things had already gone wrong, um, we dropped into a working area where we're allowed to uh, do some flight maneuvers. Uh, we'd already done the mock run. Uh, anybody know what the mock, a mock means? Mock? I'm going to come back to that. Um, anyway, yeah, we'd already done the mock run. We dropped into the area. We're getting ready to do flight control checks. So we're getting ready to pull G's, push G's, a lot of pilot checks, um, and then the backseater is doing his thing. He's doing radar weapon system stuff and, and weapons and that kind of thing. So, so we're getting ready to do that thing. Well, normally the front seater and the backseater in an F-4, the crew coordination is very precise. It's very, it's like a well-oiled machine. We're typically crewed with our backseater. Anybody see Top Gun? We fly with the guy all the time. I mean, we, we're allowed to have our primary guy, and then we're allowed to have a backup in case he's sick or on leave or something like that. So we're ha- allowed to have a backup. Um, but we, we know what each other's doing, and in the F-4 it was very important. So if the pilot was looking down at something, he had to tell him, 
hey, I'm looking down, so the guy in the back could look up and make sure he's, he's looking outside. Well, on a test flight, <clears throat> that's not always the case because there's so much to do in such a short period of time. I mean, think about it. We carry 12,000 pounds of fuel, and we burn through that in 30 minutes. I mean, because of the afterburners and, and all the stuff that we have to do, I mean, it's a lot of stuff that we have to do in a short period of time. So there are times when the front seater is doing his thing and the back seater is doing something totally different and they're not paying attention to each other and, and, really, and really doing their own thing. Well, this is one of those times. So we're into the area and we, I start doing the autopilot and flight control checks and the guy in the back is, no kidding, heads down doing his weapon system stuff and radar checks and all that kind of stuff. Well, he's really not paying attention to me and what I'm doing. He's not paying attention to what the airplane's doing in relation to the ground, and he's not paying attention to the G-loading. He just kind of, he knows it's happening, so he's just looking down, making sure that he's doing what he's got to do. Okay, so there we are. So I engage the autopilot and um, start doing some small flight control inputs, which is required to see if the autopilot handles it. And the airplane started to slowly just started to roll to the right. Okay, well, as an airplane rolls to the right, if you don't correct that, the nose will drop because the wings lose lift. So it's automatic as the airplane starts to slowly roll, it's, the nose starts to drop if you don't fix it. Well, I started to slowly try to add small inputs to try to fix it. Nothing was working. I started adding more horsepower to it. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm grabbing with both hands, trying to move the stick to try to fix this thing. Okay, so we're passing about 550 miles an hour. We're about, uh, I don't know, 60 degrees nose low, accelerating quickly, and we're almost totally inverted. Oh, my goodness. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for this morning. I just thank you for the people that are here. I thank you for just the opportunity to worship. Um, a lot of people in a lot of countries don't have that freedom, and I just thank you so much for, for that freedom uh, here in America. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for all your provision, and we thank you uh, just for, for being here. Lord, I pray that those that are here have the ears to hear, and the heart to listen, and the uh, willingness to apply what they hear to their daily lives. Lord, we thank you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. Don't worry, we'll come back to this story. But I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. Now, although there are several similarities to the fighter pilot world in the Christian community, and I will get into a lot of those similarities, there's one thing that's for sure not the same. One thing for sure that's not similar. In the fighter pilot community, when you show up and say, I want to be a fighter pilot, they will tell you right up front, this will be one of the most difficult things you'll ever do. It's hard, it's going to be tasking, it's going to be physically hard, and many don't make it. Not so much in the Christian community. Now, I was raised in the fighter pilot community on four rules of communication. Rule number one, see if these apply to the church, some churches. Rule number one, anything goes when you tell your story, because we tell a lot of airplane fighting stories, okay? Anything goes when you tell your story, so long as at least 10% is true. The 10% rule. Okay, rule number two. These are true, two rules. When talking about someone, so long as it's funny, none of it has to be true. That's rule number two. And rule number three is sarcasm is a gift that should be nurtured. Rule number three. Okay, now rule number four I'll get to in a minute, all right? Now, I was not raised in a, in a Christian home, all right? The first memory I can remember is in the fourth grade. My dad was gone to Vietnam. He was, he was a, a Navy pilot. And uh, when he left for Vietnam, my mom and sister and I went to a very small town here in Alabama um, to live with my grandparents. Um, past Jasper, Carbon Hill, then a little town of... 300 at the time of Eldridge, Alabama. And my grandparents were devout Baptists, so they went to the local uh, Baptist church. And so we did, along with them, we got to see 
vacation Bible school, Sunday school, and all that for the year that we were there. My second exposure that I can recall for, for church and being a Christian is in high school when I met my future wife. Okay, but we'll get into that a little bit later. I went to college to be a marine biologist. Um, when I was in the eighth grade, we lived on Midway Island, out in the Pacific. And we, I learned to scuba dive in, in the eighth grade. And we scuba dived all the time. And then I scuba dived through high school, and I thought, wow, Jacques Cousteau was, Jacques Cousteau was my hero, right? So how cool would a job like that be? So I found a school. I went to Troy, Troy State, uh, in their marine biology department. So I soaked up a lot of biology for two years, and then at the end of two years, I realized one important thing. I hated biology. <laughs> I, I hated it. It was too hard. I wasn't going to make it. So I had to change my major, right? So I, I changed my major, and uh, we had to come up with plan B because now I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. So I was sitting there at the, uh, in the dining hall with my future wife, and uh, we came up with plan B. All right, so I was one of 75 new student pilots that showed up in Columbus, Mississippi back in 1982, 83, 82. One year uh, of training, all right? And, and out of the 75 people, only 38 of us graduated. It was a tough program, and that wasn't even the fighter part. Okay, so 38 of us graduated, and back then, and I don't know if it's still true today, but back then, the top 10% of the students got their first choice of airplane. It didn't matter what it was. If you wanted an F-16, you could go to the F-16. One guy I know was graduated number one. He wanted a B-52. Got, got a B-52, okay? Well, that next group back then, the 11 to 20, 11 to 25% of the guys, they had the privilege of staying as an instructor. That was me. So, one hour after my first child was born, welcome to the military, I was off to pilot instructor training down in San Antonio. Okay? Four months later, having soaked up everything they thought I needed to know, I was now a qualified instructor. All right? So I went back to Columbus. Now, for your first student ride, um, it's a requirement that you fly with a student that's above average. All the students are classified. Above average, and he had to have already soloed the airplane. So he's midway through the program. All right. I found out later this is part of the building block approach. They don't want you to fly your first student ride with a brand new student. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I brief up with my above average post-solo student, and we're going to go do a, a flight in his, in his phase of training, which includes taking off, going to the area, climbing up, doing a spin, doing some acrobatics, and then uh, doing, coming back and doing some touch and go landings. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. So we take off, we go out to the area, we climb up to 25,000 feet, which is the top of the block, and uh, we uh, go into a spin. Now, normally what happens is the student puts the airplane into a spin, and after a turn or two, the instructor says recover, and then the student goes through the procedures and process of recovering the airplane from the spin. Right? Well, um, this above average student um, puts us into a spin, and then after a turn or so, I say recover. You know, and nothing happens. So I say recover. And again, nothing happens. He's just sitting over there with both hands on the stick doing nothing. So I say one more time, recover. And it's pretty obvious that he's not doing anything. We're now passing through 15,000 feet. Yep, there goes 10,000 feet. And uh, I am now experiencing my first ever helmet fire. Helmet fire. Now, I didn't know this until just recently. It's only been a month or so. That helmet fire is actually in Wikipedia. And this is what it says. Helmet fire is a mental state characterized by unnaturally high stress, test saturation, and loss of situational awareness. The term originates in the military where pilots wear helmets to protect their head and to muffle noise. 
Well, they got the unnaturally high stress part right. But I'm not sure where they got the rest of it. Obviously, none of those people were pilots or ever had experienced one. So having had a few, this is what I know by experience, and this is what I've been taught about the helmet fire. The helmet, it's always looking calm. It never, never shows emotion. It's always expressionless, and it never changes. Kind of like some people in church. But there are rules to the helmet fire. Because although you're very calm on the outside, on the inside, you could be screaming bloody murder. It's true. You could be screaming bloody murder. But the key is you're still under total control. You haven't lost control. You're still under control. Yeah, you're having a, a mental heart attack and your, your brain is on fire, but you still know what's going on and you're still trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so here come the rules. No leaking allowed. That helmet fire must stay inside the helmet, okay? Um, and here's where rule number four comes into play. Rule number four is no matter what's going on, no matter how severe the emergency is or can be, even if there's impending death, you must sound cool on the radio. And it's true. You, I mean... It, it goes through NASA. It goes everywhere. I mean, Houston, we're having a problem. It's, it's true. It's true. Rule number four is the most important rule of all because it's always judged very harshly. Uh, so the, the sissy that whines on the radio is, uh, he's done. He's, he's done. Okay, I think that we Christians need to learn how to control our helmet fires as well because I know we have them. All right. Okay, so back to the spinning death trap. Passing through 15,000 feet, it's obvious that the student's not going get, to get a clue. He's not going to do anything. So I grab the stick with both hands, and with him still hanging on, I'm able to recover the plane from the spin and then start a slow climb back into our, our reserved airspace because we blew out the bottom of it. So after about a minute or so of us starting to climb back into the area, he, he comes back awake, I guess, and starts talking and... And he goes, well, what do you want to do now? And I go, well, you know what? I'm done with the area work, so let's go do some touch-and-go landings. Thinking, he's done this solo. He's above average. Should not be a big deal, right? Right. So we head back to Columbus Air Force Base. Now, Columbus has three parallel runways. Airplanes are going to all three of them all the time. Okay, and, and then back then in the, in the 80s, in the afternoon, uh, Columbus Air Force Base is busier than Chicago's O'Hare. It's busy. And so everybody needs to know where they are. They make radio calls so everybody can kind of keep track in their head where everybody is to kind of stay out of everybody's way. Well, does anybody know what an overhead pattern is? Probably not. Anybody have any pilot experience or airplane stuff? No? Okay, so it's basically a box pattern, which is you fly over the runway and you, you turn crosswind and then... You turn downwind, and then you turn base, and then you have a, a final. Well, they take that pattern and squish it into almost a circle. So you fly over the beginning, the beginning of the runway, and you configure and get ready for landing, and then you start a final turn, which is a descending final turn, and you roll out right before the runway, and you, you touch and go. Okay, so it's very compact, and it gets more airplanes in the pattern. Okay, so my student shows up, and he goes into the brake. He pulls the power back to idle like he's supposed to do puts the speed brake down and starts slowing down when, he, when the gear, and then he puts the gear down and the flaps down when the speeds allow. And then we're getting ready to, to start our final turn, and at this point, um, the airspeed's bleeding off still, and he forgets to add the power back first, and then he forgets that this final turn needs to be a descending final turn. So we start a level final turn with no power. Well. It takes about two seconds, and then the nose just drops off them. Now we are in a full stall. A full stall at 1,000 feet. Okay, so I take the airplane again. I throw the power up. I roll wings level to help give me more lift and start looking for a place to crash because the book says it could take 19 seconds for these engines to spool up from idle. 
I milk the airplane, and the engine starts spooling up, and we're able to climb away from the ground. But when I rolled wings level, I crossed all three runways perpendicular. Airplanes were everywhere, breaking out, going all over the place. So uh, I did the landing right after that. Um, in, in my mind, that guy wasn't touching the stick again. He was done done forever as far as I was concerned, um, but I'll never forget walking into the squadron um, and the supervisor just sitting behind his desk just looks at me and he, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, shaking his head, going quite the first day, huh, Lieutenant? Okay, so there was remedial training for me to how far to let students go before taking control. But even in fighters, I was an instructor in fighters as well, um, I had the reputation for pretty much sitting through anything that didn't bend metal. I mean, it was a learning process in my mind. So off we went. Now, anybody besides me ever have the feeling of not being totally equipped for something you're in the middle of? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was me. Needless to say, this one ride changed the way I approach education and training for the rest of my Air Force career and later my Christian walk and my Christian growth. I learned that even if I attended all the required classes, soaked up everything they had to offer, it might not be enough to keep me out of trouble. It might not be enough to allow me to do my job. And it might not even be enough to keep me alive. So I realized right then I had to take some responsibility for my own training. Now, if you will, if you brought your Bibles, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 5. We will get into some scripture. Hebrews chapter 5. And we will start in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 goes like this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, there's an expected maturing and growing up that is to take place. It is not presented as optional, but expected. Now, in verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Do you sense a time limit here? There's a time limit. When I learned to fly the F-4, I had to go to the F-4 schoolhouse. And it took six months to complete and graduate. Six months of F-4 training. Um, after I finished, uh, I went on to Germany. When I arrived in Germany, even though I had 1,500 hours of instructor time already in a different airplane, I was brand new to the F-4. So I was brand new to their squadron. And I realized one important thing right away. I was just a wingman. I was not allowed to do anything or go anywhere by myself. And you might ask why. Well, a guy right out of the schoolhouse, right, a brand new guy in the jet, is not considered mission ready. There's an enormous amount of follow-on training that has to take place before you're qualified and ready to accomplish the mission. Now, it wasn't everyone's goal to be an instructor, that's true. But it was everyone's goal to be qualified in as many things as possible, as quickly as possible, so they could take their part in the team, to do their part. In my 26 years in the Air Force, I never heard or saw or witnessed any new pilot showing up and you going, nope, I'm good. I just want to be a wingman, qualified to do nothing. Never happened. All right? I believe it should be the same for the Christian. It's not okay to do nothing. Now picking up in verse 13. For anyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled. That word unskilled? Underline it. It means lacking the skills required or ignorant. So if you have put yourself on a milk only diet, you will always lack the skills required and be ignorant in the word of righteousness. 
that make sense? Okay, so everybody see that movie? Uh, the dog, the stupid dog goes squirrel. Okay, I'm, get, I'm getting off my nuts a little bit here. Have you ever heard anybody say, uh, I think we're going to look for a new church because we're just not being fed? Ever heard that? Okay, when I, when I think of somebody not being fed, what, what do you think? I, I think of a person sitting in a high chair waiting for somebody to feed them. Um, you never hear that from anybody at Golden Corral or the China Buffet, right? You don't. You don't see anybody at a big, huge buffet going, I'm not being fed. Uh, okay, well, now I've had, I have issues, so I have sensitivity training several times. <laughs> So, so my response, and they, they say, oh, you, you need to go talk to Richard. You got, you got issues with being fed? Go talk to Richard. And, and so in a loving way, you might hear something like this. You're not being fed. Seriously? Look around. There's food everywhere. We have a men's group. We have a women's group. We have a marriage group that talks about enrichment and emergency procedures, all of which are d- developed around discipleship. Not being fed, seriously. Well, maybe it's time to put that bottle down, crawl out of your high chair, grab a fork, and get in the buffet line. Right? Okay, it's tough love. And they they do call me Mr. Compassion. (laughs) Picking up in verse 14. But solid food belongs to those of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. For that word use, you can insert the word habit. And for that word exercised, you can insert trained by constant practice. Then it reads like this. Those who by reason of habit habit, have their senses trained by constant practice to discern both good and evil. As Christians, we are to develop good habits by constantly practicing. Nobody ever said it was going to be easy. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7 says, Exercise yourself for godliness. Or in other words, train yourself. And another translation says it this way, Keep yourself in training for godliness. It's about discipline. The scriptures give us the needed hope, directions, and goals. The Holy Spirit provides that power. But Christian discipline is the method. It's work. Now, when you're in a career field that's dangerous or one that kills people, the first time it happens, uh, the first time it happens in a squadron, um, somebody close to you dies, you start looking in the mirror. There's some self-evaluation that takes place. You start asking yourself questions like, Would I have made that same mistake? Or could I have handled that emergency and landed that plane? Spouses start looking at their husbands and say, Really? This is what you picked? Maybe you should pick something else. And many did. At that time, I made a promise to my wife that I would never die from ignorance or stupidity or lack of practice. Think about it. It's like promising never to make a mistake no matter how severe the emergency is. Or never to let someone else kill you. I used to fly with a lot of students. All students will try to kill you. (laughs) They will. I have learned all students try to kill you. (laughs) If you think about it, it was a huge promise requiring a ton of extra effort. It's simple. You have to know what you have to know. This has two meanings and both apply here. The good news is you don't have to know at all. But it's important to know what you need to know. And then that, that stuff that you need to know, you have to learn it. In order to help me stay focused on what I needed to know, I came up with some categories that helped me learn fighter jets and their missions uh, for every jet I learned. Now, I think you will find that all these categories will apply to our intentional spiritual growth. They're similar. All right? All right, you ready? Number one, 
You have to learn the jet. It doesn't do any good to crawl into a nice cool jet if you can't take off, start the engines, and land. You have to know the basics cold. And they have to become second nature. Flying a jet has to become natural and require very little effort. There's so much going on with the mission, weapons employment, self-defense countermeasures, and monitoring your women to simply focus on just flying. I remember the first time I sat in the F4, the front seat, and I, I'm looking around, and there, it's, it's, there's stuff everywhere. I mean, there's no spare inch on, on anywhere. And I thought, there is no way I'm going to learn what all this stuff does, how to turn it on, and I might not even remember where, where all the stuff is. I mean, there's just so much stuff. But after a while of disciplined practice, what once was very deliberate and required a lot of thought became second nature and required very little thought. It was just natural. For me, it's the same as being a mature Christian. We have to know the basics cold. Loving God and obeying his commandments has to be second nature and require very little effort. In other words, it has to become habit. It has to become habit. We have already proven we can make habits. We have just used that God-given ability, a cool ability, for our sinful purposes. Because someone is always watching, we need to be a Christian all the time. It should be natural and second nature. And it comes with a lot of practice. Number two, you have to know the emergency procedures. One of the more important things to learn is how to handle situations when things aren't going well. As an Air Force pilot, I can tell you we know for sure that all jets, all contracts of jets were given to the lowest bidder. It's a fact. All fighter pilots are required to practice their emergency procedures in the simulator every year. And every 12 to 18 months, we're even given a check ride on those emergency procedures. Most pilots did as required. They would go into the sim and practice the basics, the stuff they knew would be tested on the check ride. And then when they were done, they'd either get out early or goof off with the rest of their time. Not me. I had a promise to keep. What I like to do is grab another instructor and play the game Dial a Disaster. My good friend Z-Man and I were great at it. We would take turns piling up emergencies to see how much we could take, how much we could handle, and still get the jet on the ground. But we would also intentionally make it impossible to land, to see if we would make the correct decision to get out, or if we'd fight it all away and crash and burn. It's an important lesson. I have to tell you that these high-intensity training sessions saved me and my jet many times. Real quickly, think about some of the people you know. Who do you respect and why? Somebody has to know of somebody they respect, right? Why do you respect them? Well, the ones that I respect in the fighter pilot community as well as the Christian community, the requirement's the same. The ones that are consistent and handle adversity well. Think about that. I mean, anybody could fly a perfectly good jet on a perfectly good weather day, right? Well, any Christian can act appropriately when times are good. It's how they handle adversity. All right? Because how we act and handle life's emergencies tells everyone who we really are and what we really believe. Do they fall apart anytime something comes up? Or, or are they the same? Trusting God. When dealing with life emergencies, what role does your faith play? Think about that. Faith. Well, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, has an answer. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you have faith? When somebody asks you, do you have faith? What's your answer? How do you know if none's ever been required? Really? We all have our safety nets 
And when things get difficult, we usually trust ourselves, don't we? Faith is demonstrated when we say, God, you got this. But we typically won't do that until when? Until we've exhausted all options and there is nothing absolutely we can do about it. Only then we say, God, you got it. And guess what happens? Our faith starts to grow. It's a growing process. James chapter 1 and verse 3 says that the testing of your faith produces patience. So we know there will be testing because all of us don't have enough patience. When dealing with emergencies, what part does fear play? Are you afraid? I believe that all fear can be put into two categories. Two categories for all of fear. First category is the fear we're not supposed to have, and yet we have too much. Second category of fear is the one that you're supposed to have, and we all have not, not enough. We have too little. As a fighter pilot, I had the opportunity to experience many emergencies and potentially scary missions. I got to fly, up, I got to fly over 500 miles an hour at 100 feet. Now, above the ground, um, that's above the ground, and trees are not considered ground. I did my checkout here in Alabama, and have you noticed how tall the trees are here? <laughs> Some would think that would be scary. I had engines catch on fire. Many engines catch on fire. One caught fire at 1.6 Mach. 1.6 Mach, what does that mean? Really fast. Okay, 1.6 Mach means 1.6 times the speed of sound, or in this case, about 1,000 miles an hour. An engine fired 1,000 miles an hour. I had both engines compressor stall and flame out on a mock run. So I'm going through this sound barrier, and then both engines just rolled back. That was bad. <laughs> I was struck by lightning several times. Once I was struck twice within 10 minutes. It was a huge thunderstorm. I got zapped twice. I had to land in weather that was so bad nobody else was able to do it. And I did it when the fuel was so low that if I messed it up the first time, it would just be too bad because I didn't have enough gas to do anything else. And I get asked this question a lot. Were you ever afraid? Were you ever scared? It's actually an easy answer. No. No, I was never afraid. I believe you can train the fear out. Now, I'm talking about that first category of fear, the fear you're not supposed to have. Okay? Because as you train and practice, you strengthen your skills, and what was once scary becomes routine. Our faith is the same. The more we exercise it, the more we train it, the more it grows and the stronger it gets. And the stronger your faith, the less scary things become. No matter what you face, hey, God's got this. It's okay. When I was growing up, my dad was, as I said, a Navy fighter pilot. And um, when he came back from Vietnam the second time, um, he used to tell stories about when he and one other pilot got, got tasked to launch off the carrier to see if the weather was as bad as everyone was saying it was. It's true. It's, the term is weathership. Okay? And then I've been tasked to do that job. Um, I, I thought everybody should have a turn. I mean, why just two guys? Why my dad and one other guy? It should be spread around. It just doesn't seem fair. Well, I learned many years later that being a fighter pilot isn't always fair. We are sometimes launched into adverse conditions on purpose, and we have to be ready. Don't think for a minute that we Christians aren't launched into adverse conditions on purpose. We are. It's the nature of the job. Number three, you have to learn the rules. This will be fun for you. In almost anything, if you don't know the rules, you'll be taken out of the game. When you have a big exercise with 50 or more airplanes airborne at the same time, it's critical that everybody knows and follows the rules. It keeps people alive. 
All right? We as Christians should be known for following the rules all the time. We need to lead by example. If we as believers won't follow the rules, who will? Really? We are actually told to obey the laws and rules of our leaders. It's in Scripture. I will remind you. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Or how about Titus chapter 3, verse 1? Remind them to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Or how about 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13? Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Any questions? This is actually a subset of category one. Knowing the rules and following them is part of knowing the basics. It should be second nature and require very little effort. Squirrel? Oh, okay. Driving here from Colorado, I saw a lot of cars pass me with Christian symbols on their car. And in the window, guess what's in the windshield? A radar detector? Anybody own a radar detector? I'll make fun of you right now. Okay, why? Why? Why would a Christian own a radar detector? A device for the sole purpose of helping you break the law and get away with it. That's not right. That's not right. Okay. All right. By the way, in case you're wondering, yes, I follow the speed limits. I do. And no, I don't cheat three, five, or ten miles an hour over. I follow the speed limits. When you've been 900 miles an hour at 300 feet, anything below 100 is pretty slow-mo anyway. <laughs> Number four, you have to learn the mission. Generally speaking, the mission of the Air Force is to fly and fight. And if you don't do that, your mission is to support those who do. Everything that everyone does is built around accomplishing the mission. As an Air Force pilot, as an Air Force fighter pilot, every single day was built around learning practicing, or accomplishing the mission every day. It's the same for the mission of the church, or at least it should be. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19, go and make disciples. Now, although a lot of people like to put the emphasis on the word go, I think it should be on the word make. Furthermore, there's a, there's a, a command in there that tells us between the lines, you need to be a disciple before you try to go and make. You can't, you can't make a pilot unless you are one. You can't make a disciple unless you are one. All right? People tend to, and churches also tend to gloss over that next verse, verse 20. Teaching them to observe, meaning obey, all things that I have commanded you. Notice it says all things. Not just some of the things. That's part of the mission. Are we doing that? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we see that the mission of the church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And who are the saints? Anyone? Who are the saints? We are the saints. Exactly. We are. The best way to equip is through discipleship. So either we do these things or we support those who do. Doing nothing is never an option. So what is a disciple and how do you make them? How many believe they are a disciple? Go hands. Cool. Look around. See who they are. Well, first, being a disciple is a complete and total commitment. Jesus says in Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, verse 33, you cannot be my disciple unless you give up everything you have. That means don't be possessed by your possessions. 
That means don't hold on to anything tighter than with an open hand. If you've got a hold of it like this, you're holding on too tight to something. All right? Jesus also says in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, they cannot be my disciple unless they love me more than they love their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and themselves as well. And Jesus goes on in verse 27, those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Let's understand, the cross is a death instrument. So it means dying to self. Die to self every day. Your life is not your own. It's almost like being a husband. Uh, actually, it's, it's exactly like that. <laughs> so you become a disciple in the biblical sense only when you are totally committed to Jesus Christ and his word. All right? Whether or not you are a disciple is easy to prove because there is evidence. So we don't have to take your word for it. In John chapter 15, verse 8, it says, You will bear much fruit. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, You will study and obey God's word. You will study and obey God's word. There's that in again. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, You will love one another. Jesus is saying, love one another as I have loved you. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, yes, and all who desire, to, this is the promise I love, the promise. All who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So we are all soldiers. It's going to be hard, and we have to be ready. Think about army soldiers today in Afghanistan or the desert. 120 degrees, they carry a 100-pound backpack, their weapon, they're being shot at. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Soldiers have to deal with that. So how many still believe you're a disciple? Is there an evidence? Is there evidence? All right, good. Very cool. Okay, now equipping the saints and making more disciples. It's my favorite. Believe it or not, it is more than just transferring knowledge. All right? It's not just to explain things. It's a lot harder than to read the Bible. Maybe start in the book of John. No, nope, that doesn't cut it. Students can be informed, educated, and entertained and still not be equipped. All right? Believe it. In the fighter pilot world, we use the term, see one, do one. Yes, the student shows up to the briefing having read what to do with a basic understanding. But then the instructor teaches them how to do it with techniques that work. All right? Now, if that's all there was, giving them the information, there would be no reason to go fly the mission. There'd be no reason to go practice. There'd be nothing. Because he, he's always going, oh, yeah, that's easy. I can do that. But what happens? Life happens. Okay, so now he's under six, eight, nine G forces. So my 200 pound body now weighs 1,800 pounds. My little 10 pound head weighs almost 100. I'm struggling to get that breath. I can't breathe. And I'm struggling to keep blood in my head so I don't pass out. And all of that's going on while I'm trying to do what he told me to do. Life, right? Here comes the C1, do one. So we go fly the mission. And I say, don't, don't do what I say. Do what I do and here's how. I show him how to do it under those conditions. And then he gets to practice while being supervised. Because he's going to try to kill himself. Right? Students try to kill you. So that's why the supervisor is there to protect him from that. So he gets to practice. This is discipleship. In a nutshell, this is discipleship. In discipleship, the student hears the new information, but then sees how the teacher relates all the information together and how he uses it in real life. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 40, everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. 
How are pastors and teachers judged? By how their students are doing. Pastors and teachers who haven't equipped their students to do the work of ministry, guess what? End up doing it for them. As a supervisor, I had the opportunity to fly with a lot of different students. When I didn't have my own student, I got to fly with all the students, kind of like quality control. And it was very obvious to me who the student had been flying with because they were always like their teacher. The church needs all body parts to function effectively and efficiently to accomplish the mission, making disciples. I used to hate it when we'd have a tough mission coming up and it was always the same pilots that had to do it because not everybody was qualified and not everybody was ready to do those kinds of missions. Everyone needs to get qualified. Everyone. Moving around a lot in the military, you know, you go someplace, you plug into the church, you spend three or four years there, and then they transfer you someplace else, the life of the military. But sometimes, as we're traveling, we get to go revisit churches that we used to be a part of. It's kind of cool. The sad part about that is we'd go back to a church that we hadn't been to in three or four years, and all the people were still the same. All the people, the same people, were still doing the same thing. And the same people were still doing nothing. Very sad. In the two years of biology, I learned one important thing. If something stopped growing for more than a short period of time, it was usually dead. It's true. It was dead. Number five, moving right along. You have to learn the enemy. The enemy. While in the reconnaissance world, I spent a lot of time studying the enemy. It was important to know what he looked like. And for me at the time, it meant what his jet looked like, what his radars, um, missiles, and basically anything that he could use against me. And then once I could identify them by sight, by sight, I needed to know the capabilities of each and how best to defeat them. I remember spending a lot of hours in the classified materials vault reading and studying the enemy. Now, uh, back in high school, when I became a Christian just so that my wife would date me, it's true, it's a true story. Yep, we met the first day of my senior year and her junior year. The girl in the green dress. Yep. And it wasn't long before I started asking her out. And she would have nothing to do with me. Not at all. She was polite, but no. Well, um, you know, there was some frustration going on there for me. Uh, but, but toward the end of the school year, I mean, we met in... September, right? So back then it was September. And, and now it's getting toward the end of the school year. It's like May. And, and I was desperate because I was getting ready to go to college. And so I, I finally found out why she would never date me. She said I would never date or even consider marrying somebody who wasn't a Christian. Well, okay. I'm a type A kind of guy. How hard could that be? So the next weekend, I became a Christian. It's true. It's true, yeah. A real Christian, whatever. See, the youth pastor told me, well, he actually asked me a question first. He said, do you believe in Jesus? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I did Sunday school. And then he said, all you have to do is to say the sinner's prayer. And then life would be good. I thought, that's simple enough. I can do that. And he said, oh, by the way, I'll say it. All you got to do is repeat it after me. Well, that's even easier. I could surely do that. But, let's think about that. Does that even qualify under the rule number one, the 10% rule? Did you know that sinner's prayer is not even in the Bible anywhere? It's not. The guy lied to me. He also failed to mention that there was an enemy. And if the enemy can't have your soul, he will attack your weak areas and wherever your temptations are. He will try to take away your joy, separate your family, take away your health, or even your ministry. 
And he's very good at all of that. Believe me, there is an enemy, and you must know him. Number six, you have to learn the weapons. Now, the one thing about flying a rather small jet is you can't carry all your weapons all at the same time. We're very limited on what we can carry. So it was important for us to know what the target was and what kind of target was so that we could select the proper weapon. Okay? So in doing that, we learned that each weapon had its own specific reason for being. Now, it's true, some were very generic, general purpose, but others were very specific in their, in their use. Some, if not delivered in their own special way, with certain restrictions, could actually kill a delivery man. So you had to know the weapon and how it was to be used. If you are a follower of Christ, let me remind you of what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand up against the devil. And in verse 13, so put on God's armor now. Then when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist the enemy's attacks, and after fighting to the end, you will still hold your ground. Make no mistake, we are at war. But the good news is we do have effective weapons for our day-to-day -day combat. All right? But we must diligently learn those weapons, how they are to be used, and with what restrictions, and for what purpose. Okay, number seven. We're almost done. Almost halfway. I'm kidding. Number seven. You have to know yourself physically and train appropriately. Now, this is something that most pilots leave out and consequently don't become as good as they could have been. All right? But I'm six foot tall, or at least I used to be. I think I'm 5'11 now. And I have low blood pressure. And in the fighter pilot world, that's bad. Because the whole key to surviving in the fighter pilot world is to keep blood in your head, and high blood pressure helps do that. Okay? But with low blood pressure, it's really a lot of work. So... I had to work out with weights on a regular basis, I mean daily, to, to strengthen my muscles, to squeeze the blood back up into my head, all right? Now, I had to work at it a lot harder, but I, it did keep me in the game. The reality is, naturally, I'm a 150-pound weekly. It's true. In high school, I weighed 92 pounds. I got married, I weighed 150. Yep, I'm a mere shadow of myself. Um, I have to work out regularly, not only to maintain my size and strength, but, but to keep things going, all right? Um, if I go on vacation, this is true. If I go on vacation, even if it's to an all-inclusive resort, and I've, I've, ex I've tried this, all, an all-inclusive, all the food you could ever want, I'll actually lose weight. Because if I stop working out, what happens? I lose my appetite. I lose my appetite, what happens, my muscles start to shrink and fade away, and I start losing weight. Aren't we all, as Christians, 150 pounds, 150 pound weaklings, virtually speaking? Really? But we have to continue to try to get stronger, try to get smarter, try to do that, try to feed ourselves. It requires discipline to work out regularly, and we need to do that. Number eight. And finally, we need to practice and hone your, our skills. Now the bad news. It isn't enough to know. You have to know how to use what you know. You can't just know. You have to know how to use what you know. The Bible isn't just a book to learn and study. It's also to be practiced. It's a playbook. As I have said, discipleship is more than just a transfer of knowledge. It doesn't do any good to only learn the flight manual or the playbook or only to teach the guy how to do it. You have to practice. You actually have to go out onto the practice field and eventually you got to get in the game. I used to ask my wingman before each training mission what he needed to practice so his weak areas won't, won't or didn't get us killed. Right? We have to practice everything, not just what we're good at. In the fighter squadron, it is expected that every pilot learns and becomes the best pilot he can be. Because being average gets you killed. You can't just be an average fighter pilot. They, they don't last long. 
All right? We need to practice everything and not just what we're good at. Likewise, in the church, it should be expected that everyone would become the best at what God's called you to be so that you can take your place on the team and do your part. All right? Now, I'm sure there are examples of every, everyone in here has got an example of what you thought was important and you did the work. You disciplined yourself, you trained, you studied, you got ready for whatever you thought was important. Well, believe me when I tell you, this is important and it's worth that effort. You might have fears you think would be restrictive. But you know what? God knows your capabilities. He knows your strengths and weaknesses and he can actually work around them. Believe it or not, I'm afraid of heights. Well, remember, being a fighter pilot was plan B. I really didn't think that through. It's true. But here's the cool thing and how God used it. I got really good. I got very good at flying, flying very low and very fast, which was the mission back then. I know a lot of pilots who aren't afraid of heights but were deathly afraid to fly low and fast. Let me tell you something. If you will make the effort, God will honor that effort and fuel that desire. He will. He wants you to know him. He wants you to grow and mature and eat real spiritual food. If you will commit to doing this, you'll find yourself in situations and places you never dreamed possible. It's true. Getting up here in front of people was not my idea. It wasn't. In fact, the first time I ever did it, was three weeks after I had the idea. I was, I was up all night with this vision, with this thought, and I went to my pastor and I said, hey, I, I, I'd like to share with the, the congregation. And he goes, oh, okay, how much? You want five or ten minutes? I go, well, probably 45 minutes. He goes, oh, you want to preach? I go, no. <laughs> three weeks later, I was standing up in front of 300 people for the first time ever. My heart just pounded and pounded. Never like an, any worst emergency I ever had. I mean, my goodness. Um, so God can use you. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let me be perfectly clear. This is not about works. It's not. This is about trying to be better. And it's not also trying to be better than somebody else. The only person you should try to be better than is the person you were yesterday. All right? That's true. This is about rising up and deciding to become the person God's called you to be. This is about getting equipped so that you can take your place on the team and do your part. The mission of making disciples. There's only one thing worse than not knowing what God wants you for your life. It's knowing and doing your own thing anyway. Think about that. Yep. It's time to put down that bottle of milk, crawl out of our high chairs, grab a fork, and get in that buffet line. And this morning is a great opportunity to challenge ourselves to do just that. All right? Okay, so you want me to go back to the airplane store? Okay, real quick. So there we are, passing 550 miles an hour, about 60 degrees nose low, and almost totally inverted. All right? The guy in the back seat still has no idea what's going on in front because he's got his head down, buried, doing checks and reading checklists and that kind of stuff. Um, he, he has no idea because I'm not talking to him. I get very quiet when I'm trying to figure something out. It's part of my test saturation correction, so I don't try to do more than I can do, so I just focus on what the problem is, and I'm having a problem. Okay? Um, I had the stick with both hands, and the stick was simply not going to move. I mean, the stick didn't move at all. It was frozen, frozen, so, frozen solid in this position. All right? So now you might start thinking about, okay, well, that's when all that training that you did kicks in, right? All that training, yeah. Well, um, there's no training for this. None. No, it never happened before. So um, now I'm starting to think about command and bailout because we're starting to get close to the ground. And we're really getting ready to go supersonic. And, and, but then I'm thinking, if I command bailout, man, at this speed, that would really hurt. That flailing injuries, body parts, it would be nasty. So, so I'm thinking about that. And then I realize I remember an important life lesson. 
And the life lesson is like this in the fighter jet. If you move a switch or push a button that causes a reaction you can't live with, try to undo it as quickly as possible. So I'm thinking, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Autopilot. So I reach over and I disengage the autopilot from memory because I know where it is. And the stick broke free. It was the autopilot engaged a separate actuator that was frozen. So I un disengaged it. Everything broke free, recovered from the dive. About that time, we're climbing back into our area. The uh, backseater pops his head up and goes, hey, I'm done with all my checks. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> true story. This is a true story. Yeah. He was ready to go home, having no idea what just happened. Okay, so what is the point of a story like this on a morning like today? You see, there were two guys in the same plane at the same time, only separated by five feet. All right? But they were in two totally different worlds. The guy in the back seat was right on the brink of a catastrophe. All right? But was completely unaware and was completely comfortable in his own skin. All right? Sometimes we just need to, we just go through life with our head down, doing what we do day in and day out, really not paying attention to what's going on around us. And what we really need to do is sit back, look up, and remember what's important. All right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. I just pray that uh, everybody here can take a little bit of what, of what was said here and, and just apply it to their life and take it home. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor Sean and, and uh, what he's doing here, and discipleship and teaching, and I, I just pray that you would bless them immensely and, and grow the church. Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.